Please welcome our moderator, Bloomberg Television anchor Sherry Ann, and her panelists, Vice President of the United Republic of Tanzania, His Excellency Dr. Philip Isdo Ampango, CEO and founder of Aza Finance, Elizabeth Rosiello, President and CEO of PayPal, Dan Shulman, and Senior Minister of the Republic of Singapore, Tarman Shemugaratnam. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. The title of this session is The Two-Speed Global Recovery, The Dangers of a Widening Rich Poor Gap. Of course, for the past few decades, we have seen the global economy converge with lower income countries catching up to wealthier ones thanks to capital, the advance of technology. But it seems the pandemic has reversed that trend. So we are now seeing the IMF warn of a dangerous divergence. We are seeing, of course, this being exacerbated by the great vaccine divide. More than 90% of populations in lower income countries are still unvaccinated. So this panel will try to tackle those issues to see where we're at in the state of the global recovery. And of course, how we can heal really the biggest scars of the pandemic and try to ensure an equitable recovery. We have an amazing lineup of guests. Thank you very much for joining us today. First of all, His Excellency, Dr. Philip Israel Mpango, Vice President of the United Republic of Tanzania. Elizabeth Rosiello, who's the CEO and founder of Aza Finance. Also Dan Schulman, President and CEO of PayPal. And of course, Tharman Shamugaratnam, Senior Minister and Chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Welcome to you all and thank you very much for being here with us. Let's start with the state of the global recovery, because as I mentioned, we have seen this rich and poor divide just become more persistent during the pandemic, become more evident. Let me start with you, Mr. Vice President. What are you seeing in terms of the global economic recovery and the inequalities that we're seeing within nations, within Tanzania, around the world, among nations as well? Well, first, um Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, this is a great chance for us um, in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to share with the world uh, the experiences we are having uh, with the pandemic. Um, well, first, what we see is a very sluggish recovery, but very uneven. And um, it is sluggish, particularly for countries like uh, Tanzania, where, to start with, we had very weak um, public health systems. And therefore, we really took uh, a hard knock, uh, having to struggle with uh, a very nascent uh, uh, health facilities. Uh, we had to convert uh, even theaters at some point to be able to accommodate um, hmm. um, health patients, uh, people uh, that succumbed to the pandemic. Uh, we had to uh, really struggle with uh, related facilities, oxygen, for example. My own country has only one uh, oxygen plant in the whole country of 60 million people. And therefore, uh, you, you, you can guess uh, the consequences of having to, to struggle with uh, over 150,000 uh, patients. Uh, but also, uh, the unevenness uh, comes because some families uh, lost their loved ones. And in that case, when you lose uh, bread earners, you know the consequences. Uh, you throw the entire family uh, in, um, in poverty. Uh, I can cite an example where a family in three days uh, lost the head of the household and the mother of the household and both professors. So we have really uh, lost out. Mm. Uh, but apart from the health uh, sector effects, 
uh, we have had uh, a serious knock on the economy and the financial uh, sector. And, and here, tourism, for example, right. as uh, the borders closed, we did not receive uh, tourists. No airlines were coming. Um, so tourist uh, operators shut down. Jobs were lost. Um, and uh, same for trade. International trade collapsed. Uh, we could not um, import the right. necessary raw materials uh, from our major trading partners, China, India, and the like. Really, this pandemic has been a very tragic one for everyone. Indeed, very, very tragic. And um, I think really key here is that uh, we ask the advanced world Mm. not to forget sub-Saharan Africa. Because the challenge that we see is that uh, uh, while uh, the advanced economies are recovering relatively faster because they have the vaccines, we don't have the vaccines. Uh, the facilities that have been availed to us, they're just too little. And the pandemic is global. On that note, let me ask Minister Tharman about your thoughts on how much have high-income economies done so far faced with this crisis and this divergence that the Vice President is talking about? Well, I think the, vice, the divergence in, that we know in a very sharp sense <coughs> is the divergence in vaccine access. That's well known. But I think underpinning it is now a gulf that's opened up in trust between the developing world and the advanced world, a gulf in trust that's opening up even within societies. Uh, some societies have come out okay. In fact, there's some societies where trust seems to be even stronger than it was before COVID because people found a way of collaborating with each other for the common good. But there are many other societies where divisions are just <coughs> sharper than they used to be. And we see that in the news every mm. day. And trust in institutions across the world is now lower than it was two years ago. It was already weakening for some years, and it's um, much lower than it used to be. Trust in some governments has held up. Trust in many governments is now weaker than it's ever been. And trust in multilateralism is at an all-time low. Um, on all the issues to do with the common good. Right. Trust in multilateralism or even plurilateralism, the G20 and other groupings, uh, trust is lower than it used to be. And we have to be concerned about that, and it means addressing it not just through narratives, not just through saying the right things. We need concrete collaborative ventures, whether it's on climate change or making sure that we can scale up vaccine production and distribution, or critically, looking beyond COVID, addressing the issues that existed before COVID and now are now much more accentuated. We have a crisis in learning. Uh, the biggest divide in the world, by the way, by far the most profound and the most dangerous divide we have is in learning opportunities. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on the ground because, of course, Elizabeth, you cater to frontier markets. What are you seeing? So I would say hope is not all lost. It's true, there's been 6 million vaccinations in Nigeria, which is a population of 206 million. Um, that's clear. But the entrepreneurial resilience of the African continent, where I've been running this business for eight years, is unmatched and unparalleled. And it was during COVID that we saw the, the rise of the first African unicorns. And there are now seven unicorns on the continent after a decade of being almost zero. And all of those are in digital businesses. And amongst my peers on the continent, we're used to you know, epidemics, you know, the election violence. We've closed our, office, our offices in Nairobi, in Lagos, in Dakar. 
10, 12 times over the last eight years. So we already had a work from home mm. strategy. Our employees were already completely set up. You can give an allowance for energy or be coming online. It was a seamless transition. So it's almost a bifurcation of the economy in terms of the traditional formal government economy and also the informal online youth economy. And the resilience that we've seen and the bounce back has been tremendous. And even in the, fi the formal financial sector, we have seen you know, record-breaking returns for the Nigerian banking sector just announced. And I think what we can see is that you know, um, there hasn't been a lot of international investment outside of international aid on the African continent for the last you know, few years. Nothing matched with the venture or, or private equity investment. So what's, what, what that has mean is that a lot of bootstrap companies, like Aloysius here, another catalyst uh, mm. working, a, a lot of companies that have been 10 years without funding that are now you know, perfectly positioned to thrive in this kind of market. Dan, what are you seeing on the ground, especially when it comes to Elizabeth, talk about some dynamism still on the ground? Well, I think the uh, pandemic exposed, as Thurman was saying, trends that have been happening for a long time. Um, there are at least 1.7 billion people throughout the world who don't have access to financial services. I would say you could double that, that are underserved today, 100 million incremental people went into extreme poverty uh, during the pandemic. Um, and it disproportionately has affected um, uh, women. Um, it's affected uh, many vulnerable uh, populations. And so uh, this was going on before, but the pandemic really, I think, cast a, a spotlight on it that we cannot ignore. Like we are all a part of our communities. Businesses are a part of their communities. Governments are a part of not just their own uh, country, but, uh, but the world community. And so I think um, the pandemic is gonna force us hmm. to think about how we think about the world in general, because I think when you have such unrest that Tharman was mentioning, as His Excellency was mentioning, um, that threatens the foundations of political systems as well. So I think it's a, it's a dangerous time, and I, I think uh, we need to be sure that there's an equal recovery uh, as best we can. Just a reminder for our audience, if you have any questions, you have the NEF app, so you can send us your questions, and I'll get them here and try to get them for you. But Dan, let me just go back to your point about, of course, the pandemic really exacerbating some of the existing problems, like Minister Tharman was saying. It's not that we didn't have a divide. We did. But it just worsened the situation. What about some of the bright spots? Because we also saw this acceleration of digitization and perhaps really the interconnectedness of the world. And what is PayPal doing there in order to have a recovery that includes everyone? I mean, clearly, the world leapfrogged into, you know, call it the, actually the beginning of the digital era uh, right now. Um, and everything we do, the way we work, the way we live, the way we uh, get our medicine, the way we uh, educate ourselves, went into a digital realm. Uh, the way we finance, the way we pay for things went uh, digital. And I think, um, you know, my hope for this, um, and, and the reason, and if I get up every morning and I'm excited about what we're trying to go do inside PayPal and working with others throughout the ecosystem is that I think there is a solution rooted in technology. I mean, everything is moving to the mobile phone. The mobile phone is getting less and less expensive. Like you can get a good mobile phone now for like $25. Mm. And so it is a thing that's connecting us together. You have all the power of a bank branch in the palm of your hand right now. M-Pesa taught us that right away. M and PayPal and M-Pesa now are interoperable so that you can work together. And I think you, if you use the technology, you can make the managing and moving of money faster, less expensive, and by doing that, hopefully drive some incremental financial health, which I think is, again, the bedrock of so many things. At the same time, though, I have to wonder if it's also going to sort of increase the digital divide as well, because, of course, we know many people in Africa are still not connected 
to the internet. What have you seen, Mr. Vice President, when it comes to the pandemic and the acceleration of digitization? Well, um, I, I think the gentleman who just spoke uh, has it right. Uh, from Tanzania and the rest of uh, the continent, uh, we really see that there is an opportunity if the advanced world could share with Africa uh, the digital technologies, the right from screening, uh, testing, and so on. And this would, uh, um, would make a huge difference for us who are still struggling with, uh, with such facilities. But in addition to that, we would need the multilateral institutions, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, mm. uh, the regional banks, to come in uh, with even more uh, financial support uh, to really be able to uh, enable sub-Saharan African countries to access uh, and uh, buy these technologies, buy these uh, uh, medicines to fight the pandemic. So there is an opportunity. It's not that, uh, uh, yes, indeed, uh, there are challenges in terms of uh, how fast we can absorb uh, digital technologies, but already uh, Africa has uh, shown wonders, uh, for example, in applying uh, mobile uh, technologies uh, right. to, to reach our people in the rural areas. And I, I don't see any problem at all that we can catch up very easily. And and as mm -hmm. I think it was said, uh, the African people are innovative, they are resilient, uh, they can match up uh, fairly quickly <laughs> as long as uh, the digital technologies are shared with us. Elizabeth, uh, in terms of digital technologies being shared across Africa, what are you seeing and what are perhaps some of the prospects of new technologies like blockchain that could ac actually accelerate some of the progress there? Well, I mean, honestly, we joke about this a lot at the company, but the internet access in Kenya is better than in London sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on a rem I have a house in Lama, which is on the remote northern border of Somalia and Kenya, and you have 5G access thanks to some mesh networks that were set up by a local community. So mesh networks have been, you know, 10-year project across Kenya, and we're seeing that all over East Africa, et cetera. Similarly, when you enter the airport in, in Senegal, on the other side of the continent, they've had fingerprint access, digital thermometer readings, um, the ability to screen for, for COVID for some time now. So across the 55 markets, you see all sorts of levels of digitization. When we were the first company to introduce cryptocurrencies on the continent in 2013, which I guess was too soon. <laughs> and we had some bumps along the road, but now it's quite exciting to see the uptake. And actually during the last two years, we've seen so many central banks move forward with legislation and policies that you know have taken eight years to, to move forward and in the last two years have almost raced to the forefront, including the introduction of the e-Naira in Nigeria just last month. Let's talk a little bit about the regulatory framework there, Minister Tharman, because uh, Elizabeth was just saying that perhaps they introduced cryptocurrency a little bit too soon. What are the risks of that? And I know that you've been looking at crypto, blockchain, all from the lens of fintech and the opportunities that it presents. Well, I think we've got to always start with the use case. What's the objective? Not, not what, what's the solution, but what's the objective? So Dan spoke about financial inclusion. That's a, that's a very large use case because a large part of the developing world still doesn't have financial inclusion. Uh, even just internet access, right? A large part of the world, roughly 80% in the developing world, doesn't even have internet access. Uh, a large part of society, even within the advanced world, doesn't even have internet access. Um, I'll give you an example. And it's really worth shining a light on this. Uh, about 20% of sub-Saharan Africa and a good part of the developing world has internet access. 80% don't. In Detroit, Milwaukee, Baltimore, it's about 30% of school-going children that live in homes with internet access. They're developing countries. So we've got to shine a light on the basic problems, and that defines our use case. How do we improve internet access? How do we get more learning inclusion? How do we raise standards? How do we have financial inclusion, access to credit for SMEs? 
Those are the big challenges of the world. Not so much the incremental changes in costs for cross-border uh, payments and, and stuff. That's all interesting and, and useful. Mm. But those are small ball issues. The really big challenges are staring at us in the face. Inclusion and sustainability are huge challenges. The technologies exist for some of them, particularly for inclusion. The technologies are getting there for sustainability, still not fully bankable or investable, and we've got to accelerate it through a lot more public-private risk sharing. It requires risk sharing, not just um, support for collaboration. It requires money to be put, risk capital to be put in place to share risk, because mm. otherwise the technologies aren't going to be in place in time for the next decade or next 15 years for sustainability. So that's what it takes. And I think at the end of the day, if COVID has had a benefit, it is that it has illustrated, unfortunately in a tragic way, but it has illustrated that collaboration internationally is far, far less costly than not collaborating. And preparing in advance for pandemics and other crises is going to be far, far less costly than not preparing. Let's talk a little bit about that collaboration and what you mentioned about public and private partnerships. Dan, how do you use that in order to ensure a safe ecosystem, and especially when it comes to perhaps upgrading the broader financial system? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, no company um, is an island unto itself. Um, I think um, and I think the business world is slowly but surely recognizing that um, we have multiple stakeholders. Um, those stakeholders include our communities, um, they include our employees, um, they include partnerships with governments and regulators and customers. And we need to think about what is our purpose as a company um, and have both profit and purpose work hand in hand together. Um, we can't just be about making money. We need to be about what is the impact we can make in the world. And, um, and I think, um, some companies are talking about that and others are actually doing things about that, putting their products, putting their uh, capital to work to look at larger things than just the company itself. And I think that um, each of us have our own impact to make. Uh, we've got to do it in partnership together. There's no way that PayPal can make an impact without working with people like His Excellency and the senior minister and others around the world. We have to work hand in hand together. Regulations need to permit uh, responsible innovation uh, to happen. Um, but there are so many things that we can do when we put our mind together. For instance, like we do these working capital loans. Um, these working capital loans go to the 70% of uh, states in the in the US where 10 or more banks have closed branches which are underrepresented neighborhoods um, and 70% of our loans go there and it's because we use technology we use different things and traditional FICO scores and that kind of thing mm. to really think about how can our products help these underserved communities that's part and parcel of our mission and part and parcel of what our values are as a company and I think if all of us can lean into this, and there are ways that we can help in all parts of the world, I, I think the impact can be profound. We just can't think about it as like, we can only do this. We have to think about it in its totality, that the impact could be mm. quite substantial if we do that. Elizabeth? I couldn't agree more. And one example is that we process for 35 of the largest remittance companies in the world. And remittances are essential to the growth of the African continent. And it's not just the transaction costs. Most remittance companies struggle with accessing last mile, with accessing float, pre-funding, treasury. These might seem like 
you know, esoteric ideas, but it's, it's what actually opens up the flows of that 34 billion coming into the continent. And without fintechs and without technology companies to do the hard work of building into those APIs, digitizing the last mile, connecting the mobile money like M-Pesa, like MTN, like Orange, like Airtel, Bartik, into the banks and the banks into them and to the cash networks, that's when we get that seamless layer. And then development money, private sector money can flow. But until we get that infrastructure built, it's really a bottleneck to a lot of growth. I worked for five years in microfinance across the continent, and I saw this huge bottleneck into accessing funds. Right. And, the, and the second part is about the use of the dollar. So a lot of the funds distributed across the African continent are still distributed in US dollars and then on lent in local currency, causing it a huge FX mismatch, which is something that needs to be addressed. So I can just build on that. International remittances are one of the most important inflows into certain economies. Mm. And traditionally, the international remittance, the fees for that can be up to 8%. If you go digital wallet to digital wallet, mm. you can do that at 80% reduced cost. That, when you look at the flows that, that go um, in international remittance, it's a huge number, getting money to those who most need it. Mr. Vice President, what's your view on what's being said right now? And let me just also add to that a question from our audience who's asking, the challenges have been highlighted, but what are the opportunities for emerging economies? And the reason that I'm putting those two together is because at the end of the day, you can support developing economies, but you also need that private capital to flow by itself. And how do you make yourself more attractive? Well, uh, first, before that, um, um, I wanted to follow up again on the technology issue. I think there are simple things that we uh, really need to, uh, to work on. One of the issues which concern us um, in Tanzania is the whole issue of having a responsible social media. So, for example, uh, instead of uh, giving a balanced view on the vaccines, some of these social medias are really talking about, you know, the result in making people impotent, uh, you know, they cause sudden death and that kind of. Mm. And in the rural setting, and even in urban areas, it is very difficult for ordinary people to basically say this information on the social media is incorrect, right. that kind of uh, information um, is the right one. And therefore, for example, the, the phobia we are seeing on vaccines partly stems from what I think is irresponsible social media. And uh, uh, both of us have a responsibility mm. to make sure that we are educating uh, our populations and giving them uh, the, right, uh, uh, the right information to be able to fight uh, uh, this, this pandemic. Right. Uh, but also let me uh, add that um, I think I would like to see uh, the developed world um, supporting us in what I see as positive, the positive side, the opportunities uh, that mm -hmm. have arose from uh, from COVID-19. Uh, COVID For example, there are some industries that are now coming up uh, to produce sanitizers and that kind of, uh, and I think it is important that we provide incentives uh, to those industries mm. uh, using fiscal policies internally, uh, but also facilitating uh, trade uh, importation of various inputs that uh, go into 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 such uh, into such industries, but even imp more important, I think, I would like to see uh, the developed world cooperating with us on R&D, uh, and in terms of some could relocate uh, some of the uh, the industries manufacturing the vaccines, for example, to the African continent. They can work with our local researchers uh, to push. Uh, the knowledge frontier. So I think there are ways in which uh, if we work together, uh, we can uh, defeat this pandemic uh, fairly, uh, fairly quickly as compared to now that, yes, 
Uh, we are innovative, we are resilient, uh, depending on the circumstances we are in. For example, in Tanzania, we decided not to go for a total lockdown because for a population that really depends on uh, you know, a daily uh, subsistence way of life, if you close them, you go for a total lockdown, it's almost imposing on them a gas chamber, which we couldn't do. So yes, there are uh, solutions that we can uh, push for. It's mm. not just the effects. Uh, we are perfectly capable uh, of finding solutions to uh, move ahead. Minister Tharman, let me ask you a longer term question, of course, when it comes to the broader international financial system. What can we learn from this pandemic when it comes to building a sustainable uh, environment where we do op see opportunities for everyone? So first, by the way, I should say that I agree entirely with what Elizabeth and Dan were saying about remittances. So don't get me wrong. The cost of financial inclusion is a serious issue and remittances are, are a significant part of earnings for a large part of the population in the developing world. Using the cost of that is a very good thing. Um, on your broader question, I would say, and this touches on what um, Dr. Mpango just said, um, to be honest about it, if we try to tackle a pandemic after it is started, um, it is very costly and it's going to take a very long time. And that's what we've learned in COVID. Speed and scale is everything. And if you start only after a pandemic has broken out, um, even with the best efforts and the best private enterprise and the most remarkable speed of vaccine development, we're still in a situation where 20 months on, the majority of the world's population hasn't had a jab in their arms. So we have to prepare beforehand, and that's a huge lesson coming out of COVID-19. We must have ahead of time manufacturing and distribution capabilities ahead of time. And there's no way the private sector or the markets are going to deliver that. First, they don't know exactly which pathogen is going to be the, the source of the pandemic. They don't know which vaccine is going to succeed and get through phase three trials. So it requires public-private collaboration in a much deeper sense to be honest, the US did it quite well. The US through BADA and that whole combination of government agencies did it quite well. It was developed over the years. In the last year and a half, in an almost un-American way, government did well in the US. <laughs> Even the US Army was involved in the logistics, right? And we need to have a global BADA that's what we need to develop ahead of time with public money sharing risk, all the way from R&D to developing the manufacturing capability, have ever warm manufacturing facilities, which you use as best as you can in normal times because you've got TB, you've got malaria, you've got a whole set of endemic diseases, and you've got to as best as you can use those facilities to deal with endemic diseases in order to then pivot hmm. in a pandemic. So starting once a pandemic has broken out, you've got to try your very best, mobilize resources as best as you can. But even with those best efforts, it not only takes long, but you allow mutations to evolve and the pandemic becomes longer for everyone. It's hugely costly. So just going back to the simple point, the cost of preparing in advance is infinitesimal compared to the cost of not preparing. That's the lesson of COVID and it requires international collaboration, and the cost of collaboration is infinitesimal compared to the cost of not collaborating. On that note, we'll leave the conversation here. Of course, those lessons that we've learned through COVID and perhaps what we can do next. Minister Tharman, thank you very much. Dan, Elizabeth, Mr. Vice President, it was great having you at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.